Hello everyone and um, welcome to the Equality Republic um, seminar. Uh, for those of you that um, have just joined us, we're very really pleased to have you here today and um, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes just introducing BRAF, who we are and what the Equality Republic is all about. So, um, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone, um, thank the organisers of this of this event, because I always forget to thank people who work behind the scenes to make this event happen, and our speakers and um, our chair in particular, who's actually stood in today for a colleague, um, Richard, uh, who is not very well. So, um, thank you for coming along today. So a little bit about BRAF, we're an Equalities and Human Rights Charity and we were created really about 22 years ago to be a transformative force in the equality sector. I can't honestly say that we've been a transformative force all the time, but we try our best and I'm sure um, many of you will, would um, attest to that, that aspiration. And part of the reason that we formed the Equality Republic was that we recognised that many people want to make an impact on the inequalities and in, in human rights, but actually we, we haven't. We've been doing good things with good intentions, but we haven't always delivered what we wanted to deliver. And part of the Equality Republic's mission was to create a movement really of people who wanted to raise our game, who realise that being okay, doing stuff that's okay, was not actually okay because equalities is life-changing, working on life-changing issues. And if you want to change lives, as we all do, we need to think more critically about the impact that we want to make. So part of what we're doing, um, the aspirations for the movement, is to um, educate ourselves, to challenge ourselves, and to stimulate different types of thinking. So it is, a, it is a movement that is about change. It's a movement that is about impact. It's free to join. And we are, um, this is one of several seminars and events that we've had, which is really about shaking things up. So um, this seminar is about education, opportunity or the status quo. I spoke to you a little bit about the Equality Republic. These are some of the events that we have coming up. So on the 20th of May, we have an event that's called Anti-Racist Futures. And we're really looking at whether we can create an anti-racist city in Birmingham and um, you're very welcome to come along to that. And on the 12th of July, we have the first anniversary of the Equality Republic. So we launched it in July last year, um, and this is going to be celebrating our first uh, year, and hopefully we're gonna have um, a really good opportunity to talk about what the year has brought for us in relation to equality and human rights. So just moving on to the event. Uh, so. Um, Part of what we're doing this evening is to explore education um, and explore the education system. And in particular, we're focusing on its purpose and whether it can tackle racism, whether it really expands horizons and prepares young people for a diverse society. So I'm really um, going to be, well, I'm not like yourselves, very interested in this discussion as an ex-teacher and someone who is a lifelong learner and an educationalist in, in my own right. Um, it's going to be an opportunity to really critically examine um, what we think we're doing and the impact that we think we're making. So I'm going to hand over to Amrit now. Um, so as I said, Amrit is um, kindly stepped in to chair the event for us and is from Coventry University where he is uh, Assistant Professor of Business Analytics. So I'm going to hand over to you Amrit if I ask you to maybe say a few words about yourself and then we can crack on with the seminar. Okay, hello everyone, uh, my name is Amrit Slage. Uh, I'm an Assistant Professor, Senior Lecturer in Business Analytics at Coventry University. Uh, I've been involved in higher education for over 18 years prior to that working in industry in a variety of roles but I've seen the education sector grow quite significantly over the last 18 years and we've seen a, a, a great diversity certainly at our university of the student body that enters the university um, and obviously we want to see all students attain the best of what they're capable of doing but the question is are they being able to uh, uh, it does the educational system in the wider context allow them to do that um, 
as an analyst, I've been involved uh, in supporting the university in its race equality group many years ago. And more recently, I'm also a member of the university's race equality council. Okay. I think the seminar offers some great interesting opportunities for discussion because it's going to explore how schools and colleges can be engines for social change and how we can reform them so they equip young people with the skills they need to live in a diverse society. Okay. So society is global. It is very diverse and continues to remain diverse, but how do people fit in? And are young people from all backgrounds being able to achieve their full potential? Yeah. The, the seminar is going to look at what's taught, how it's taught, and the different outcomes experienced as a result. Okay. At the heart of some of these concerns is the Eurocentric nature of the curriculum and the way different aspects of history and culture are presented. And fundamentally, whose story is told? I mean, there's been a lot of discussion, certainly with, um, with events over the last year, in terms of uh, what history is included or not included in the curriculum and how it impacts on individuals' life and who, who, and who they are. Um, we've got some two speakers who've, uh, who've joined us today. We've got Indajit Dahal and Professor David Gilborn as well. Indigit has been involved in the equality and diversity arena for three de decades as a community activist organizing on issues including police harassment, immigration, immigration and housing. And Indigit's equality work led to a senior civil servant role at the Department of Education where he spent 12 years. In addition, we've got David, um, Professor David Gilborn, who is a professor of critical race studies and founding director of the Center for Research in Race and, and Education at the University of Birmingham. So what I'd like to do is open the floor to Indigit to give you 15 minutes, right? Um, to talk about this topic about um, education, generating the opportunity or supporting the status quo. Over to you Indigit, thank you very much. I'm gonna move on to David, um, who's Professor of Critical Studies and Founding Director at, uh, of the director of the Centre for Research in Race and Education at the University of Birmingham. I'm going to offer him 15 minutes to respond. So uh, I, I can't really respond directly to a lot of the things that Indigit said because I agree with almost all of them uh, and I'm afraid I, I certainly can't uh, provide explanations where he was bigging me up and saying how much light I was going to shine on these things. What I'm going to try and do in my time is to look at four key issues and then hopefully we can develop um, some of the commonalities between Indigit and my presentation and some of the things that um, everyone wants wants to talk about and see where it, where it takes us. Um, so the four things I'm going to look at, I'm going to think about different understandings of the word racism, how anti-black racism affects children and adults across numerous aspects of the system, how is it that we can start to change things? And finally, I want to say something about current government policy on race and education, because if we thought things were bad uh, under Tony Blair's administration, uh, they've gone on to another level um, under the Conservatives. So in terms of how people understand the term racism, um, there are lots of different ways of doing this, but I think it makes sense to think about two basic um, approaches. One is the traditional view of racism, which sees it as a rare occurrence. It's associated with crude, obvious acts of race hatred. Um, so when white people hear the word racist, they think about people that look like that picture. They think about skinheads, neo-Nazis. Um, but racism isn't always that simple and that obvious. Critical research looks at how racism operates beneath the surface, shows how sometimes racism can be quite subtle, complex, and a lot more common than is usually uh, recognized. So this approach identifies racism by looking at the effect of actions and processes. So if a process has the effect of discriminating unfairly against one or more minority groups, then that's prima facie evidence of racism. 
that focus on effect, not intention, is really crucial. Um, because the people involved in racist acts often will be completely unaware of what they're doing. They may be genuinely well intentioned. They may actually believe that what they're doing is in the best interests of everyone. And yet what they're doing is remaking those systematic inequalities generation after generation. And white people fail to recognize this kind of racism because it just looks like business as usual to them. They don't, it doesn't fit their understanding of racism as being about neo-Nazis. The racism that saturates the education system just looks like a normal school to most white people. And the reason why it's worth thinking about these different understandings is that the approach you take to racism defines what action you're going to take in terms of trying to address racist inequality because the traditional view of racism assumes that well there must be a problem with the minority it assumes a deficit they're, they're lacking in something so the traditional view leads to people saying well what does the minority group need in order to fit in or do better whereas a critical understanding says well what can we do what can the system do to behave in a more equitable way and that's really critical in terms of taking things forward now different groups are subject to different racist stereotypes um, one of the ridiculous things that is trotted out by the right is that if, if one minority group does well that must prove that there's no kind of racism in the system all white people if they stop and think about it know that white people have different stereotypes about different groups. One of the most rigid and deeply entrenched is anti-black racism. So black people are widely stereotyped as being physically endowed, but not intellectually gifted. These stereotypes are literally hundreds of years old, but you can still see them in play today when you turn on the TV, read a newspaper or walk into a school. So for example, black children are more likely to be placed in low rank teaching groups where they cover less of the curriculum, they get poorer resources, and of course, they make less progress. And that process starts as soon as they enter primary school. Black kids are disciplined more quickly and more harshly than their white peers who are doing exactly the same thing in the classroom. And that means that they're catapulted through the different disciplinary levels and massively overrepresented in exclusions from school. And black adults face very similar situations. They're given fewer opportunities and subject to much more surveillance. As a result, black adults are less likely to be promoted, but they're more likely to be on temporary contracts and to be disciplined. These patterns are long established and very clear in multiple professions. In the education system, from primary schools right the way through to universities, through the criminal justice system, and right across the health service. Now, policymakers and managers will often talk about fairness and justice and equal opportunities, but somehow the system keeps on recreating itself. And that's because most racism is of that more subtle and complex kind. It's the business as usual, mundane, unremarkable racism. Um, the crude, obvious acts of racism, if you like, are the tip of the iceberg. Um, the bigger problem is what lies underneath and just threads through the daily life of institutions like schools and hospitals. And this is why we have to build anti-racism consciously into all of our work. Because if you don't build in anti-racism, the system will just automatically carry you along in remaking the existing inequalities. Uh, think of it um, like being caught on a conveyor belt. If you don't get off the conveyor belt or do something to stop it and change direction, the conveyor belt will just keep carrying you along inevitably towards the same outcomes year after year. So if we don't take deliberate action, 
nothing will change. Unfortunately, at the moment, things are changing, but they're changing in the wrong direction. I've worked in race and education for more than 30 years. And for the majority of that time, policymakers have ignored race inequity. Very occasionally, something will happen. It usually involves bloodshed or um, mass protest. But very occasionally, something happens, like the Stephen Lawrence campaign which draws attention to the situation and means that the system has to at least give the impression of taking the issue seriously. But soon the rhetoric is forgotten, nothing really changes on the ground and things go back very quickly to how they always were. That system, that cycle of appearing to move forward but not really changing. That's very familiar over at least the last 100 years. But at the moment, we're in a different situation where I think racism is being actively taken forward across policy. So we're told that white working class boys are the forgotten victims in education. These are just two uh, headlines from 2020. You'll be very familiar with this argument that white working class kids are the forgotten demographic, um, the most deprived and ignored ethnic group in Britain. Uh, and yet, since 2008, annually, we have a succession of headlines proclaiming that white working class kids are the lowest performing group in schools. Whenever I talk about race and education. One of the first things that happens is that somebody tells me that I'm behind the times because white people are now the lowest achieving group. Well, the evidence in front of you suggests that they're certainly not forgotten because every year uh, there's a succession of headlines telling us about how bad white people have it. Um, and actually, they're also not the lowest achieving group. These are the government's own measures of achievement at 16. And the figures that I've put up at the moment only relate to kids in receipt of free school meals. So these are kids uh, living in, in poverty. And, and kids in receipt of free school meals are the group which is almost exclusively focused on when the government talk about education. And you can see from the statistics that actually the white British group, which I've highlighted in red, are not the lowest achieving group. Uh, Gypsy, Roma and Traveller kids do much worse than white kids on every measure. And Black Caribbean kids are also less likely to get good passes in English and maths. So the stats show that white kids are not the lowest achieving group, even if we only look at those receiving free school meals. And it's important to realise that although the government take free school meals and say, well, those are working class kids. Actually, most working class people don't appear in these statistics. In Britain, about 13% of school kids receive free school meals. For white kids, it's actually about one in 10. But 60% of adults think that they're working class. So those headlines that I showed you which are based entirely on free school meal statistics. They take statistics about the most disadvantaged 10% of white kids, but by calling them working class, they pretend that they're describing what happens to a majority of white kids. And I've argued in front of the select committee that that amounts to generating race hatred. Uh, the committee quoted that, said it was very interesting, but then decided to keep on using the label uh, white working class, even though it had admitted that it was completely inaccurate. But if we look at the 87% of kids who don't receive free school meals and who the Department for Education very rarely talk about, then we get a very different picture. So the figures that are on the screen at the moment describe the achievements of the vast majority of kids across the country. Now you can see that white kids aren't the highest achieving group, but they're by no means the lowest achieving. 
They do better than their peers of Gypsy Roma heritage, Black Caribbean, Pakistani, and dual heritage mixed race kids with one white and one Black Caribbean parent. So despite those headlines about the white working class, they might dominate the headlines, but they certainly aren't forgotten. They're not the lowest achieving group, and they're also not working class, the kids that are shown up in the statistics which the Department for Education like to show us constantly. But before I wrap up, I just want to look at one more piece of information. Now, this, this might be encouraging or it might be even more depressing. I'm not quite sure. This government have set themselves against anti-racism. Um, you could say that they're anti anti-racist. I prefer to turn that around and call it what it is, which is pro-racism. Um, this government and parts of the media have decided that there's something to be gained by playing up racist sentiment across the country. So the Home Secretary described the Black Lives Matter protests as dreadful. The Culture Secretary wants to, and I quote, defend our culture and history from the noisy minority of activists constantly trying to do Britain down. And they established the Commission on Race Disparities headed by Tony Sewell, the guy that um, Indigit mentioned. They've put in charge of a commission on race disparities, a man who has described the phrase social justice as being problematic and who's on record as saying that institutional racism no longer exists. Um, and that's a commission which was described by the Muslim Council of Great Britain as partisans of a culture war keen on downplaying race disparities. So while all of this is happening in the political sphere, there are some signs of progress. So last year, following the Black Lives Matter protests, a survey of a nationally representative group of UK adults asked them about how much teaching was done around racial injustice and black history. And in each of the main ethnic groups, the largest proportion felt that there ought to be more teaching about racial injustice and more teaching about black history. So there aren't any obvious easy solutions to any of this, but the battle clearly is not lost. And as always, the lessons of the past demonstrate that if we're going to make change, it's always going to be driven by community mobilization, by protest, by minority communities that make it impossible for the government to pursue the current agenda. But I've spoken for 15 and a half minutes. So and I found it very interesting, rather, how although we, we wanted to have a, a discussion and debate from opposing sides, actually one the the points that Indigit made blended into what you had to offer, David, in, in terms of you picked up from what Indigit was saying. I mean, there was quite a degree of similarity in both your opinions on that. You're defining what is racism. And, and I, I found it very interesting where you said the traditional view is that it's the it's the other person. The problem is with them. It's their deficit. Whereas a critical racist, um, a critical race theory takes a look at what, what can we do? What can the system do to be better for people? Um, and personally, from a, a data perspective, where you said that they compare the statistics of performance when it comes to school kids uh, and they measure you should be measuring like with like with like whatever you measure and you're looking at the performance of black kids versus the performance of white working class kids so when you're talking about white working class kids you're including ethnicity and even economic social status so if you want to compare um like with like you 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 could start comparing black working class kids with white working class kids or black school kids and white school kids for consistency I'd like to ask, are there any questions that we would like to add, add, um, address to the panel, please? So there's two here. Um, one is, I'm curious about where the panel feels the opportunity for challenge and change sits. The educational racism issues are a well-worn cry. It seems impenetrable to reform. So where's the opportunity for change? And then the second question, in terms of pushing for change, what can and should parents do 
So there's a related question there, which is around how do we raise these issues with local authorities? So how do we raise these issues with local authorities and what can and should parents do? In terms of my response, I'm going to basically build on uh, quite a bit of what, what David said, which is, um, so I, I have been inside the system a bit like Serpico, and we know what happened to Serpico, uh, and he couldn't turn around the NYPD. And you know, so th there are things we can do from inside the system, uh, as, as I tried when I was in the DfE. But as David said, change comes from the pressure on the system, you know, from community-based campaigns. Uh, and I, I always go back to that quote from Stephen Anden, which is issues into campaigns and campaigns into movements. And I think the, the system only changes when there is significant pressure on it to change. You know, the, uh, the purpose, the DNA of the education system is deep. Uh, and as Dave, David has said, is uh, you know, racism is embedded in there. So what I'd say to parents is, is campaign, is lobby, is join uh, the governing body if you can, or the PTA. Wh whatever you can do to influence the system, do it. Uh, because that's the only way it will start to move in the direction that we want it to move. Thank you, back to David. David? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't need to turn into too much of a loving, but, it, you know, Indigit's right. Um, I, I think what's really interesting at the moment is um, th there's there, there is a uh, there's an explosion on the way because, you know, the, the government are pouring petrol on an already um, hot political situation. So I think what was really interesting about the Black Lives Matter protests in 2020 compared with the ones around uh, 2016 um, was not just how international they were but how the people taking part really covered all age groups and different um, ethnicities um, and I think one of the really scary things for the government is when white middle class people um, start arguing about racism They've, they've found it fairly easy to sidetrack um, uh, minoritized um, protests in the past. Um, but when it starts to take on that kind of cross society um, profile, it becomes more difficult. And I think you see them reaching for um, the kind of desperate measures at the moment. The idea about making um, statues, the, the starting point for defacing a statue gets you a, a worse prison sentence um than than where rape begins i mean that there couldn't be a clearer um sign of their desperation the attacks on critical race theory i mean yeah i've been working on critical race theory for 20 odd years um it had never been mentioned in the, the house of commons before the committee on uh, the debate on black lives uh, sorry on black history last year when a succession of conservative mps lined up to say how bad critical race theory is Critical race theory is just an approach that tries to understand how racism gets remade and what we can do to fight it. Um, but it really follows the same pattern as Thatcher attacking uh, anti-racist curricula back in the 70s. It's this idea of demonizing it. Um, you know, Piers Morgan the other day describing any conversation about racism as race baiting, as if to, to, to merely talk about racism is to try and cause trouble. Um, so all of that comes from a position that assumes that all white people are kind of simple minded racists who can be brought along. And I think what we're beginning to see across different parts of society is the possibility for actually mobilizing lots of different groups. Um, and I mean, so protest is important and some of the actual facts around race equality are just mind blowing. And if, if we can bring the facts in, so it's not just about who screams louder. Um, I mean, Ofsted, following the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, every Ofsted school inspection was asked to um, consider whether race inequality was an issue. Now it's re removed to a footnote, um, which means that virtually no inspection teams mention race equality because they know it's too political. Um, teachers can be trained and go into schools 
without doing even an afternoon on institutional racism. And yet the research has shown how racism is remade every day in schools. And that research has existed for 30 odd years, but you can train to be a teacher and never even hear about it. And I mean, so I've got a statistic in front of me here that we used in, in the evidence that we sent to the, the Saul Commission, which was saying that in terms of children's literature, um, characters in children's literature are eight times more likely to be an animal than they are to be a person of colour. So, I mean, in the 21st century, I think the government and the media, large portions of the media, are trying to defend a kind of 1950s version of, of whiteness and Britain, which just no longer exists. Um, and I actually don't think they're going to be able to do that. Uh, much longer but the problem is they have all the powers of the state at their disposal to try and enforce that view thank you um so what was said was that, that we need community-based campaigns lobbying protests but for people to get involved at all different levels i found it interesting david when you just said we should share facts because there's interesting facts your slides had some really interesting statistics and key points that could be extracted. Maybe there's an opportunity to create some kinds of memes that you could that could be shared on social media with young people and make people aware of what the actual salient issues are, but in a more way that's, that young poop people would find approachable. Um, have we got any further? Could I, get, could, could I just come in on, on the back of um, something that David and, um, said, Amory? Is that OK? Yeah. Um, because I was just interested when Indrajit talked about um, the work that you did, you talked about if, if uh, teachers focus on it, so if teachers focus on race inequality, they don't necessarily have to do much different um, things, but it actually made a difference. And I, I suppose the question I wanted to ask really was for both of you is well, what is the role of teachers? Are teachers not recognising this? Are they subsumed in this system that disguises their own racism? I mean, how do we, they seem to be a, a, a group, um, notwithstanding what you said about parents and the communities, that could really make a difference to this. So what's preventing teachers? What's obscuring them? From, from, you know, wouldn't you like to be teaching a class where everyone succeeds, for example? What's, what's going on for teachers? David, do you want to? Um, okay, yeah. Um, I mean, my, my research is, is often portrayed by people that don't, don't like it um, as um, attacking teachers because um, a lot of my research is focused on how racism is made in the day-to-day -day life of schools. So the fact that really nice, well-intentioned, guardian reading teachers wind up putting black kids disproportionately on the bottom rank table and then in the bottom set, they come down on them like a ton of bricks for not taking their coat off. They don't notice that loads of white kids in the room haven't taken their coat off. They, so these things are identifiable. They are actions which are done by teachers to students. Um, and actually the research suggests they're done to black students regardless of social class. Myself and colleagues, uh, Nicola Rollock and others, uh, when I was at the Institute for Education in London, did the largest ever study with black middle class parents and we found that they were you know we're talking doctors solicitors they had a lot of contacts they had a lot of capital um and they were still banging their head against a brick wall they still came up against a school system that basically looked at black students and said well they're gonna pass so what more do you want um just this incredible low level um, of, of, of aspirations and an assumption that if, if there was trouble, it was always the black kids fault. So the examples of racial harassment that we found uh, in each case, the black kid ended up being um, blamed that they had somehow provoked the white kids into beating them up. The thing is, though, when you look at successful anti-racist schools, a lot of the people driving it are teachers and the people that have been most excited to get hold of my work are teachers. So I'm not anti-teacher, I'm anti-racist teachers and teachers that are caught up in racism without realising it. So I, I did a book years ago that looked at anti-racist schools 
and and the key thing from that was that um the 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 teachers couldn't shift it by themselves they needed a small group they had to research it they had to work with the kids um once the kids in the school got hold of like a draft anti-racism policy they were brilliant because they pushed the teachers to actually refine it because they were saying things like um oh there's there's a thing in here about um friendship groups well you don't get to tell me who my friends are that's not fair but you do get to tell me who i sit next to in class that's a different matter so the kids were pushing them to actually take it to a, to to a different place but it needed support from the school management uh and it in in the best cases it became a, a kind of virtual cycle because the more the school management get on board the more they're appointing teachers um who are on board with these kinds of things and that means that they're tending to appoint a more diverse group of teachers and then that changes the conversation in the staff room it changes the expectations um and 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 over about a four or five year period the whole nature of the school changed um but it is political there are people that don't want to teach in anti-racist institutions and there are people that fight it um and unfortunately since i wrote that book at least one of the three schools that i focus on um has closed um but one of the key things one of the key takeaways from that book was that um the schools always knew it was never never finished there was always more to do because these things are always changing so they, they could have the best policy on earth and then something would happen in the community over the weekend and they had to respond to it um my final word um this can this can all sound terrible i always do push the need to work in groups because when we work individually we're, we're easily picked off but one of the key findings from the uh, the work with black middle class parents was that so many of them when explaining how they'd survived the system because they they'd all come from working class beginnings many of them would point to one teacher that that showed an interest in them um they could tell you the teacher's name they could even point to a, one session where the teacher took them aside and talked to them about something and started working with them and that's exactly the same in the research in the states so even if you're a teacher in a school and you're the only one that sees the issues there's actually quite a lot that you can do with individual students that this it's not a, a monolith that we can't fight but obviously it's better the more we can work, work in groups Indigit, would you like to add to that? Sure, sure. Um, I won't add much to it other than say that uh, the example that I gave when I spoke about Preston Manor, the work that they did with, with the psychotherapist, and it wasn't going back to you know, how my mother raised me and all that sort of thing. It was doing exactly what David said. They were unpicking what they termed micro transgressions and talking through what happened and how would they act differently in those cases. So absolutely support what David said. I'd say the other side of it is the pressure on the system and, and the purpose of it. So if you speak to head teachers that you know sometimes that they just can't focus or they don't feel they can focus on equality because they're scared of losing their jobs uh, because of the pressure on them in terms of getting you know certain percentages over crude thresholds that that's still inherent within the system and so that drives behavior in you know certainly in terms of uh, excluding kids for, for example you know if you get them out of the school they're not going to affect your data they're not going to impact on the league tables so there, there are all those systemic pressures on uh, school leaders which then cascade down to classroom teachers you know no classroom teacher as david says intends to go in and discriminate Thank you. I see if we've got any more questions, please. We've got loads, actually. Go on then. Do three this time. Let's go for three. <laughs> we've got loads. Um, right. Thank you for the questions. Please do keep them coming. And um, so first question speaks to this point about curriculum. So when talking about teaching about racial injustice in schools, are we talking about secondary schools here? And if so, in your opinion, when might it be appropriate to tackle such issues in primary schools? Uh, I think, can we just answer that question quickly, which is absolutely not, I wasn't talking about uh, secondary schools at all. I was talking about the curriculum through from early years, right through to the age of 18. So no, and some of the best practice I see in schools is in early years. Right. 
Thanks. Um, next one, um, you talked about socioeconomic status as being a really significant factor in children's educational outcomes. How can the educational sector really tackle this? Because children exist between school and home. How can school respond to these types of inequalities at home? David, would you want to lead on that one first? Yeah. Um, one of the problems with when we when we think about um, inequality in schools is that we, we we almost automatically fall into these deficit perspectives that there's something wrong with the kids. So it must be to do with the kids or um, their upbringing or the absence of computers or books and all this kind of thing and obviously if you're living in poverty if you don't have a quiet place where you can do your homework you don't have access to a laptop in the middle of a pandemic when everything's online these things are huge barriers however it's also the case that research inside classrooms and schools has shown for at least 30 possibly 40 or 50 years now, that teachers' expectations are shaped very clearly by race, by gender, by class, by disability. So um, you, you might not believe it, but when I was a kid, I had blonde hair. And I come from a, a I'm from the white working class background, uh, but my parents were very aspirant. They, they really, um, you know, believed in education. Um, and they sent me to school um, in the school uniform and the teachers looked at me and thought, oh, he's going to be good. And then I opened my mouth and spoke with a working class accent and you could see their shoulders droop. You saw the teacher's disappointment when I opened my mouth. Um, and I can I could take you to the, the my first classroom in my primary school and show you where the teacher was standing when I realized that because of the way I spoke, she just decided that I was thick. Now, that happens day after day, lesson after lesson. Um, and it works around class as well. The kids from a certain estate, the kids who, you know, aren't uh, are maybe not turned out so well just because they're not wearing great looking clothing doesn't mean they haven't got the ability to to absolutely knock through um, uh, all of these different levels but we're all conditioned to make assumptions that's how we we operate in society we we judge situations and it, a lot of it, a lot of the time is stereotyping and it's very powerful around uh, race and around class thank you Indigit, would you like to Nothing to add to that. Okay. Just I see. Take another question. All right. I see more questions, please. Yeah, great. Um, so here we go. Um, how do you, Indigit David, envisage starting these conversations with schools about tackling racism? So I'm a training educational psychologist and be really keen to kickstart these sorts of conversations with schools. And I'll be working with as I progress through my training. So any ideas for how you start this kind of conversation with schools? Well, if, 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 I, if I start, I, I would say that these sort of conversations are taking place in and around schools all, all of the time. You know, so if I speak to uh, fr from my wife, who, who was a teacher in an inner city school, which was 90 odd percent uh, Pakistani, uh, and just speak to uh, some of, of her friends, and that's a and evidence of, of virtually nil, uh, evidence based virtually nil, but the conversations that they were having were around these issues. Um, but for me, fundamentally, it goes back to uh, David's point that the, the racism that, that takes place in schools and that you need to address is incredibly subtle. And most people don't even, aren't even aware uh, that they are acting in that way. Uh, and the schools that I've seen where that culture starts to shift, it comes from the leadership of the school and that determination to make them places where, where equality thrives. So, you know, Preston Manor was run by uh, a white working class woman um, and she wanted those debates that were taking place in the pub or on the way home or in the staff room to bring them to the fore and to influence the education provision in those schools. And I still go back to the fact that it's not rocket science. 
that, that once you are aware of those prejudices, the things that you do to address them are just good teaching and learning on the whole. And I see that o over and over again. Um, that, that's my, my perspective on it. I'll, I'll hand over to David. Well, I just, I, I think that's bang on. The, the anti-racist teaching isn't a fad or um, something you, you go out and buy a book and read over the weekend. Anti-racist teaching is good teaching. It's, it's, it's a curriculum that recognises um, the truth about um, history and the truth about the diversity of people that have, that have shaped history. The, the curriculum that, that, that's currently um, put out by, by the government is a, a, a travesty. I mean, it's a, a joke. The, the, the citizenship test that um, uh, people have to take, apparently the, the, the booklet for that only mentions one key person of colour. Uh, that people have to remember the name of, and it's the person that started the first Indian restaurant in Britain. I mean, you couldn't make it up. <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. The point about leadership is 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 critical, um, I think. Um, and interestingly, again, you know, um, Indigit's already shared some inside stories from policy. Um, I uh, happen to know that way back, uh, Ofsted wrote two key documents which are about 20 years certainly 15 years old now but still very good where they looked at what sets apart schools primary schools and secondary schools that are especially effective for minoritized students uh, and they go through you know leadership target setting taking note of the data looking for equity so you don't just look at how many kids are getting english and maths you look at well, kids in which groups? And if there's a gap, there's something wrong there. Um, but one of the things that they didn't mention was that in every case, all the primary schools, all the secondary schools, the head teacher was either themselves or their partner was of a minority ethnic background. So they got it. They, they understood the issues and they took them seriously. Um, and they realized it was complicated but they were going to keep at it. So they weren't doing it because it was a new target that had been set them for the next term. It was part of their life and how they saw education. And Ofsted removed that from the publication. So if you read those documents, you don't realise that that kind of personal dimension is, is so important. But I, I think that's a really important thing. Do you want to know anything or should we go to the next question? Um, no, I'm happy to move on. Just, just to say that the my, my first uh, flirtation with the grievance procedure at Southern Council, there were a few, uh, but the head teacher who brought the grievance was, uh, and this doesn't in any way, in any way I'm not intending to undermine David's argument uh, because I think a more representative leadership is, is incredibly important, but it was an African Caribbean woman who, who was excluding uh, Bangladeshi boys because they were affecting her results, how she was viewed uh, as a school and as a school leader. And that, that's really important, actually, because if I can just put in, um, th there's, there's a thing in critical race theory, um, an aspect, one of the, the best things, if you search online for a chapter by uh, the genius Derek Bell called The Rules of Racial Standing, and it looks at how we are all judged based on how our own race is perceived and whether we act and speak to defend or to fight racism and he makes the point that actually there's a very good living to be made by people who are minoritized but who speak on behalf of white power holders and he actually says it's remarkable that there aren't more people taking that coin because um people get promoted really quickly. I mean, you know, Tony Saul's educational qualifications are sparse. His work doesn't stand up methodologically. It's just a joke, but he's treated as an international expert because he says what um, white power holders want to hear. And his commission will report any day now that it's not about racism. It's about lots of other things and it's very complicated and we need to stop worrying about race. And what about white kids? I would recommend if people have five minutes that they read Tony Sewell's critique of getting it, getting it right, because it, it does read like a, a carry on 
script you know it, it's that bad and it's then responded to uh by a black uh, african caribbean academic I, I forget the name from from greenwich university who slaughters it uh so there, there are four pages uh, and they're highly instructive in terms of exactly what what uh, david has been saying and you know, how particularly the right loves to have spokespeople who do their job for them and and this government is take is is really perfecting that art so you know some of the the key officers of state are held by minoritized people but they're acting on behalf of you know the white elite um kemi badenoch the equalities minister um uh has you know just condemned outright critical race theory there's nothing to be learned from it um pretty patel um and and this is this this is a long standing technique paul warmington who's professor um of education at warwick has done some astonishing work on on um how kind of uh black conservatism has has become increasingly um a kind of center of power um and it's 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 i don't think it's ever been more important than at the moment okay um yeah i was i was going to raise that the point about you've got a, a quite a spread of people of color who are in cabinet or even in other senior positions who, who where the government can say look there is diversity and young people can look and, and somebody can point to these young people and say look you can make it there as well but what they're necessarily speaking may not be um aligned in the interests of people of other people of color yeah i mean what what derek bell says in the rules of racial standing is y y racism always has um the, the best cards because if a person of color says this is racism they're discounted as special pleading well you would say that you've got a chip on your shoulder mm. you're too sensitive but if a person of color says this isn't racism it's because black boys are out of control and they're pampered by their moms mm. then people white people go wow what a courageous person he's really speaking the truth wow that's fantastic i mean just comp if you do a um a google search for quotes from the daily mail about trevor phillips compare the quotes from when he started at the equality and human rights commission when he was seen as this politically correct monster and then look at the quotes when he started to condemn segregation and talk about um how we needed more integration and suddenly he was this brave moral courageous figure speaking the unspeakable it's it's astonishing mm -hmm. we talked about data at one point and from what indigit just said a little while ago that uh, his experiences of the head teacher where he worked and the head teacher had to get certain results and the society everything gets measured there's metrics everywhere and i know david you also said it's it's about getting the right data Data can be used in a number of ways. Yeah. It has to be carefully understood, interpreted, presented and analysed. Yeah. yeah. How important is it that we do, you know, that is understood? It's absolutely critical because if you really want to lie, do it with some numbers. Because the vast majority of people see a, a, a graph or a table and their critical functions are bullied into submission. Um, myself and, and colleagues uh, wrote a paper a few years ago called quant crit quantitative critical race theory and we set out a few rules for if you're going to use if you're working with numbers these are questions to think about um, and it's basically how not to be lied to by racists with numbers so it, it's basic things like when you're told these are black kids well who are they counting and who aren't they counting because the government here don't include mixed race kids when they talk about black students and yet the um the inequalities for mixed race kids with black caribbean and white parents are almost identical to those of black caribbean kids but they're actually split up in the stats so they they, they massage the stats um so it's just a bunch of rules to say this is how not to be lied to um but I mean, I, in the same way, if somebody was to give you a quote from an interview, we all know to say, well, what, what question did you ask them? Um, what context was this in? Uh, but we don't ask any of those questions when we're told a statistic. So we don't say, well, where was the data gathered? How old is it? How many people did you interview? 
Um, so they're just basic things, but but just work from the assumption that the person producing the statistics doesn't understand racism, because most statistics are based on models that do not understand how racism works through all of these different aspects. There are there are huge million pound studies that think they can separately control for race and class and um, prior attainment and all these and and what they do is they remove racism from the picture so if you just google quant crit you'll 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 get at some of that and it, the, the paper is only about three years old but it's just exploded people people are using those ideas in medicine now um internationally um it just basically trying to give you a a set of guidelines just assume that the person creating the numbers does not understand the world as you understand it Brilliant. Yeah, just yeah, just to add to that, Amrit, uh, if I link it back to the question earlier on about what can parents communities do, uh, if you approach the data with the right mindset, the data is there in terms of illuminating and exposing what's taking place either in a school, across a group of schools or nationally. So you you have the ammunition to be able to to campaign in the way we did inside the DfE uh, to use the data as a Trojan horse to, to get what you want. Uh, and, and there are schools which are using it, it really effectively. Um, and you know, for all the public services, I would say that education is further down the road of being able to, not saying it does, being able to compare apples with apples, being able to examine in detail uh, the, the effect or the implications of the actions that you take and whether they're effective or not. So, so the data exists, but it's about using it effectively, whether you're using it within a school, as a school leader, as a teacher, or as a parent or a community activist. Great, thank you. Um, we've got, I think, I see if we've got any more questions or I've got one other thing to ask both David and Indigit before we finish. Got a question if you'd like one, Amrit. Yeah, go on then, put the question out. Go on. Loads of really important conversation on the chat. And um, one of the things that's coming through is the idea of international law and talking about human rights. Where's the potential? Uh, one of the questions on that was how can we use the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child more effectively in this space, invoking children's rights? Do you want to go first? Uh, I can do. Uh, I'd, I'd say it, it's beyond my pay grade in the sense that uh, uh, my understanding of, of it, despite the fact I, I was a lawyer uh, at one point in my career, uh, I, I simply don't know enough about uh, the legislation, the institutions, uh, or how you use it. Um, but I, I'd, I'd go back to the point I made earlier that uh, change happens through a determined community activism um, rather than you know putting your efforts behind uh, legal action at, at the international level thank you yeah. if you if you remember a few years ago maybe three years ago the united nations um special um reporter on uh racism um, wrote an astonishingly um, damning report on the United Kingdom and specifically about the treatment of uh, Gypsy Roma people, um, saying it was as bad as anything that they'd seen uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, absolutely giving chapter and verse, very well evidenced with the full weight of the United Nations behind it. Uh, and the government just said how ridiculous how dare you we invented human rights and that's the same um kind of derisive response when people say but you're taking human rights away um you know the the whole brexit campaign uh went hand in hand with an attack on the european um uh, system of human rights and uh, european court of justice um so yeah, I, I'm with Indigit. I, I'm I'm afraid it, it's good to 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 document um, the outrages, to have Britain as a pariah on the international stage. But 
as you've seen with with international politics um you know you can murder somebody on tape um and not get your wrist slapped so um i think if we're going to do something about this um harshly worded reports won't do it, it the, the whole history of anti-racism in this country and and everywhere else that i'm i'm uh, aware of is that things only get marginally better when the power holders think they haven't got a choice that if they don't do something they could lose the whole thing um and you know they'll then rewrite history to pretend that they were gifting this freedom but the freedom has always been been won uh, uh through protest and, and rebellion thank you we are coming to the end of uh the session but i'd like to ask you one last question um and you started off in your first slide, you had a quote from Public Enemy where we said, here we go again, where you, you took that quote. Could you suggest two things that individually or people could do at work or within their families that we don't do this again and we do make progress in some way? And David, I'll ask you the same question, but first, Indigit. Well, the first one is just a repetition of, I think, what I've been saying throughout, which is get involved. You know, the the activism, and you know, it, if if you're not comfortable in local politics, etc., that activism can be just in terms of having those conversations in the playgrounds that that you pick your children up in, uh, or uh, the coffee shops that you speak to other parents in, or if you are prepared to get involved in the governing body of a, a school. Um, or, or in community campaigns. So I think whatever ways you can, whatever routes you can take to raise the issue and push it forward, I'd say take them. That, that would be uh, my number one. Uh, what, what my second, I'll let David go and I'll come back with a second. Okay. You don't have to do number two, but over to you, David. Oh God, I'm glad I wasn't first up for that one. Uh, so I'm going to take the easy way out and say Indigit's right. Um, I mean, if if go, going back to what I said earlier about, you know, even if you're the only teacher in the school, there are, that you can change lives. But if you can join with other teachers or, or if you're um, in the health service with other health service professionals, I mean, some of the, the, the most amazing anti-racists I've worked with uh, were part of the Black Police Association. Now, if you think about trying to pursue anti-racism in a hostile environment. Um, so, you know, th there's, it starts, it starts with what, what we can do. And, and you know, the, this particularly for me, um, as, you know, trying to be um, a white person working on anti-racism is, is the need to listen and learn um, from other people, um because we all have different experiences so not assuming that you've, you've you've understood everything listening to others i mean now that i'm getting on a bit um i, I learned so much from my kids because they're so switched on on so many equity issues um it's 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 astonishing i really am very encouraged by the way in which if you walk into a school kids are really hot on so many different aspects of equity now um, so I, th I think there are ways we can we can we can join forces across age, across class, across across race, and and really move thing, things forward. But I th I think it it has to be conscious because I think you know th these things haven't come about by accident. The education system keeps on reproducing these inequalities because that's what the education system is designed to do. Uh, as Indigit said, you know, right at the beginning, we know enough about these things that we could have got rid of them generations ago if it was important enough. It, it, it actually serves power holders um, to have the situation as it is at the moment, otherwise they'd do something about it. So there are ways that we can address this, but, but, but don't over romanticize it and imagine that everybody wants to get on board because I think it, it is a struggle and there are people absolutely vehemently opposed to us. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Indigit. Um, Joy? 
Oh, just um, thank everyone for coming along. And I, um, I suppose one of the things that I'm still concerned about, I was concerned about it as a young mom, and I'm concerned about it as a grandma, is the pace of change and how many um, children are routinely failed by um, the system and whether or not we can do anything to bring around more pace on this so that we're not just flushing young lives down the toilet. But I am encouraged by um, what Debbie says about young people. We've been doing some work in some schools and young people that we've been working with just get it. You know, they're just saying things like, you know, this should not happen. Racism should not exist. Um, we're not, you know, the, you know, they are really adamant about um, their rights, the, the opportunities that they want for themselves in this country and in the world and beyond. And I'm just wondering whether there are ways in which we can work with that because we've been, we've been a bit too um, pedestrian about, um, about a lot of this stuff. And, uh, you know, is there some way we can galvanize some effort so that we can put some heat into this um, debate? But thank you. Thanks everyone for coming along. Um, and thank you, Amrit, for being prepared to, to hold the conversation. Thank you, David. And I'm, I'm glad that you didn't keel over um, with the results of the vaccine. Um, thank you, Indijit. And thanks for everybody that came along um, to, to be part of this today. I'm hoping we got to everybody's questions in some way, shape or form. There's been a lot of stuff on the chat, which is great. So um, it's good that people felt they could be involved in that way. And thanks for the team. Um, in order in, in to do this. I mean, we are looking at taking some of this work forward into thinking about an anti-racist future. Um, this isn't our agenda. This is an agenda that we think is vital for our survival as, um, as we go for, as, as, hum, as, as human race, actually. So really important that we, we think about how we can get involved and draw on some of the excellent ideas and ambitions in the chat. So, um, please do get in touch because um, we're really keen to work with others on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.